There's uh, lots of interesting things. You know, the other thing that one needs to think about is uh, with these devices, since you don't have any control over these devices, how do you make uh, applications available while at the same time making sure that you're not compromising the data, the, the enterprise data? You know, uh, a lot of people today uh, provide access to email, right, on the uh, iPad or iPhone, you know, corporate email. But the scary thing is you've got all these email attachments in there, right? So how do you uh, solve that problem? And uh, like, for instance, uh, um, my old company and product, the SSL VPN, uh, Juniper has got uh, an iPad version for it, but Apple sitting on it, you know, still hasn't uh, approved. It's in beta, hasn't yet approved it. So uh, I think there are all sorts of interesting uh, problems that need to be solved. I don't have any one solution for you, but uh, I think there's probably a cocktail of solutions that you can create. Right. You talked earlier about how storage is kind of the final frontier and the cloud is going to enable the commoditization of what, what specific area of storage is, is going to have the biggest contraction as far as cost. Is it the media itself? Is it the software to manage and configure it? Is it the people to manage and configure it? And the follow-up to that would be, um, as far as the cloud in and of itself, there's a lot of concerns around security and compliance. And oftentimes, the storage itself, or the data itself, has the most stringent regulatory compliance and security elements attached to it. So there seem like two fighting elements converging in exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I think it's all about actually uh, storage, uh, the storage management and reliability and things like that. If you look at you know, the likes of an EMC or an NetApp, uh, at the end of the day, the actual physical media is no different than what you would get anywhere else. Right? But just think about the kind of gross margins they're able to charge uh, you know, and, and later on. And it's, it's, it's obscene. Um, but you know, more recently, you see some very interesting projects out there, particularly in open source, you know, with ZFS and things like that that are coming out. Uh, which are actually sort of uh, very effective solutions, much cheaper, using off-the-shelf uh, hardware, uh, and they're focusing primarily on the manageability aspect of things. You know, um, I think your point about uh, uh, compliance is an important one, but um, uh, there are solutions around that as well. You know, as to how to go about it. But you know, I, I really think what these guys are doing uh, is is charging for that manageability and the full solution, the whole product solution. For instance, I have an investment in a company called Certus, which uh, builds an appliance uh, which functions as a gateway. Right? So to the application, it masquerades as a uh, block level storage device or a file level, uh, you know, uh, or a file level. But uh, the actual physical storage is in the cloud. Right? And the application knows no better. You know? so, uh, but it's all around you know, the manageability and making it appear to the administrator like it's yet another story. I had a question on uh, energy efficiency side of things. It's so much bad press that uh, smart meters are getting you know, uh, because of all the fiascos in Central Valley about high charges for you know, uh, energy consumption. Do you think that the push to smart meters is actually going to <laughs> yeah, I think it will be. Uh, Kitu, can you repeat the yes, question? Yes, the question is, uh, uh, will the push to smart metering be successful? And I think, you know, uh, although there have been such sort of stumbles along the way, uh, I do believe uh, we, can't, uh, we, can't, we can't provide solutions without being able to uh, monitor things carefully and monitor usage care. So, so I do believe that uh, uh, that, that will happen. Now, the, the other interesting thing that I, I think will, could happen is um, energy generation could get distributed. Uh, so uh, every home could become an energy generator. Right? I have an investment in a company called One Block. One Block of the Grid is what uh, the company's uh, name is. And uh, what one box is trying to do is essentially uh, en enable uh, consumers to uh, put solar panels on their uh, uh, on their roofs, right? And uh, in fact, some of their uh, 
uh, customers have a negative PGND bill just because of that. And so I see you know, that there are also companies that are doing some very interesting things around solar generation, around these electric ports. So they put up uh, these uh, panels on these electric poles all over the place. And so, uh, and they're feeding into the uh, grid right out there. Right? So there's some interesting things going on there. But I think you have to be able to meet that for you to be able to see how, how well you work. Kittu, the Bay Area has a huge concentration of uh, IT folks and the semiconductor folks. And some of these people have transitioned into the energy sector. So like, how did they get into energy sector? Like, a lot of have this burning question, OK, I don't have experience in energy. And like, you have already invested, and you, have, you keep meeting so many people. How did they make the transition? Yeah, it's a, that's interesting. Uh, it's a good question, actually. So the question is, how did people make the transition from traditional information technology into energy technology? Uh, one area was on the solar side, uh, people with semiconductor experience. Uh, it was a logical transition. And even for that matter, even for venture capitalists, it was a logical transition because it used the same material, silicon. All right? And uh, on the uh, energy management sites, it's actually even simpler. It's really converting an analog signal into a digital signal and then managing that digital, uh, th that data that's in the digital form, right? So, uh, and, and, you know, it really comes down to, uh, you know, I'll give you another very good example. I was an early investor uh, in a company called Bloom Energy, which you might have heard of. They are a solid oxide fuel cell company. In fact, it uh, was NEA's first energy investment. Um, I had introduced, even before I was at uh, NEA, I had introduced uh, Bloom to NEA. Yeah, Bloom, and, uh, Bloom was started by uh, NITM. He's from NIT Trichrapalli. Oh, is that right? Okay, yeah, K.R. Sridhar, yes. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, and one of the interesting things there also, it's that there he, it was all around uh, material science. It's about ceramics and things like that. You know, all of us as, as engineers, you know, and those of you, I'm a mechanical engineer, you know, and uh, uh, it came very naturally. It finally gave me a, a chance to go back and dust my books on mechanical engineering or material science and say, wow, finally I'm actually using that degree too. You know, uh, but it it really comes down to that. It's is people finding the opportunity and reinventing themselves. You know, so uh, KR was a prof at uh, what is it, Arizona State University, and had put together a solid oxide fuel cell, put it on uh, the shuttle to Mars. You know, and the rest is history. You know, uh, and uh, you know there have been more recent things also where people have used. Uh, their knowledge in certain other areas to apply it to uh, the energy space. I mean, if you think about energy storage that I talked about, it's all about chemistry. You know, it's nothing but that, right? I mean, people, if you think about, you know, the, uh, uh, whether it's the, it be nickel cadmium or uh, nickel zinc, uh, we have an investment in the company that is a ferrous chromic uh, flow cell battery. Uh, so it really comes down to, you know, uh, how, what kind of chemistries can you identify and, and build? And uh, if you think about uh, the whole um, tin film area, right? The non-silicon tin film area. Uh, there, there also there's a lot of uh, physics and chemistry and this, uh, around materials that uh, goes into the generation of electricity. So, so just a very in terms of Silicon Valley has a uh, lot of the VCs have heavily invested in the green energy. Mm -hmm. Example of Bloom and also Salendra and all this stuff. For example, Salendra, if you take the almost close to 900 million dollars investment, <coughs> today you have real official, of course, the blue energy is much more. Uh, so if you take into that the ROI, return on investment, how long it will take you know, the rate at pace of this uh, growth, particularly, for example, some they just say they have $80 million audit. So when you have invested $900 million, what do you think as a VC, as an investor, what do you expect for return on investment for your this type of projects? It's also each project is 10 years. Mm -hmm. Nothing is coming out mm -hmm. earlier than that. So 
Coulomb energy is more than Coulomb. Yeah. So the question was, you know, uh, from a, as a VC, when you invest in a capital-intensive project like a Bloom Energy, or for that matter, even semiconductor uh, projects are not cheap. You know, they, um, initial investment is like 20, 30 million, right? Uh, we invest in biotech, particularly drug development. You know, initial investment goes into the 40, 45 million dollars, right? That's how. So, two things we do. One is we look for things that are uh, that have a significant amount of intellectual property, right? So you you have to be solving some very hard problem and solving it in a cost-effective sort of way. Because especially when you think about it from an energy generation point of view, at the end of the day, you know.